Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Secondly, we have uh, Sunda Kakwala, who's director of British Future, former general secretary of the Fabian Society, and he's an Evertonian and was also a South End United season ticket holder for a few years after moving to Essex in his teens. Thirdly, we have uh, we're pleased to have with us Daniel Poole, who's editor in chief of Expo in Sweden, the successor to Stig Larsson in that capacity, and is a board member of Expo Foundation in Sweden. And he will have a few words to say on Swedish football, I think, uh, during the discussion as well. And fourth, we have Sid Jeffers, senior lecturer in sociology at the University of East London and a long time Arsenal supporter. <laughs> right, thank you very much. Okay, so we'll get to just as now my colours to the master. I've supported Bristol City all my life and will support them for the rest of my life. <laughs> so, before without any further ado, we'll have the uh, introduction to Dylan. Okay, um, so racism today in football, is it alive and working? Um, if you don't want to stay to the end, the answer is no. Um, the, what, what I want to sort of argue is that racism isn't a problem in football. Um, and what, what we, when, when people talk about racism in football, such as the John Terry incident or Luis Suarez or um, abuse from the crowd, um, they're not really talking about racism in the sense of unequal treatment, of systematic denial of equality. They're talking about being rude. They're talking about name calling. Um, and I, I mean, I don't think name calling is a huge problem. I think the problematization of name calling is. Um, and I go as far to say that actually anti racism today is a bigger problem. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, anti racism today is a pre pretext for restricting what fans are allowed to chant, um, it's a pretext for regulating the conduct of players on the pitch. And I think that has a damaging impact for football, and I think it's also damaging. For, for free speech, for the distinction between public and private. I think anti-racism has become a much more dangerous force in society than racism. So, um, racism in football, how, how do we assess whether football is racist? Um, you can have a glass half full or half empty approach here. Um, on the one hand, you've got John Terry, the former England captain, um, one of the most um, prominent names in the game, fined and banned for using the words fucking black cunts um, in, in a match um, directed at Anton Ferdinand, and, and whether or not he meant it is, is still a matter for conjecture. You have Luis Suarez, a Liverpool striker, um, banned for eight games for calling Patrice Evra Negrito. He claims uh, there was something lost in translation. Um, you have the, uh, the Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee um, publishing, in a recent uh, published report or inquiry into racism in football, um, concluding that recent incidents of race, racist abuse in the UK, both on and off the pitch, have highlighted the fact that there remain significant problems, according to the chair of the committee. Um, the Professional Footballers Association, which is the Players' Union, <coughs> have called for racial abuse to be a sackable offence. We had um, Crown Prosecutor Nick Hawkins earlier this year calling for games to be played behind closed doors where fans have been racist. So there's a, there's a huge focus or preoccupation or debate about the, the, the perceived problem of racism in the game. On the other hand, if you look at the reality, um, black people in uh, football are overrepresented. There are probably 20 to 30 percent of professional footballers are black. It's a high-paid occupation. There's probably no other industry where where black people are such where there is no where there's complete colour blindness in recruiting players to the point at which um, there's there's a discussion in football about there being too many foreigners in the game. So English players are actually at, at the receiving end. end of, um, unequal treatment in that sense. The, 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 the Premier League is, is full of foreign players. If you look at the number of arrests for racist chanting last season, there were about 40, 43, 44 arrests um, out of um, thousands and thousands of people going to the matches every, every week. Um, David James, the, the former England goalkeeper, 
recently accused anti-racist groups of looking for stuff to be shouted about in order to keep themselves in existence. And he said, I struggle with the racist issue in football because as a player, I don't see it. In the earlier days, yes, but the game's changed. It is not what it was. I don't believe it is any more racist than society is. Um, and I think what the, um, the recent uh, furore over the John Terry affair, and, and we've seen it this week over some Serbian um, abuse of England players, is that um, racist abuse by players or fans is so shocking precisely because it is so rare. Um, you know, it used to be fairly commonplace when I started going to football in, in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, now it is extremely rare and it, it, it is shocking to fans and to players because they hardly ever come across it. Um, and I think that the discussion about racism or the, the kind of preoccupation with racism is out of all proportion to the actual, the handful of incidents of racist abuse. And I think what that suggests to me is that the discourse of racism, the discussion, um, is not about the real problem, or um, it is about, it's a, in, in effect, it's, a, it's, it, it's an expression of the fears and the preoccupations about the people, of the people having that discussion, the media, the political class, and so on. The fear, uh, which even though the working class is not a political force, there is still the fear of the mob. There is still um, uh, a loathing of, a gr of groups of white working class men gathered together. Um, and, it's that, and it's that which drives the discussion, the loathing of the white working class rather, I would argue, than any egalitarian or progressive impulse. Um, and I think it's really interesting that uh, racial insults in football are politicised, and yet a discussion about restricting um, EU migrants to the UK is not seen as racist. So the discussion about immigration, which used to be the driving force, it used to be like the the central kind of um, tenet of kind of race, racial discourse in, 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 in Britain is now, uh, is now no longer political. It doesn't raise an eyebrow. So, I, I mean, I would argue, and I, I, think, I think we'll have to kind of explore this in the debate, that racism is about unequal treatment. It's about, it's about power, and you need to have power to, to discriminate. And I think w what we see on the football picture and the terraces is are people just being abusive, and, and, not, and not very much of it. Um, and I think, that, so our understanding of racism has changed. It shows that racism today is no longer an equality issue, it's an issue of culture, and it's essentially seen as a problem of white working class culture. Uh, racism is no longer a progressive desire to change society and to deliver equal treatment, it's instead a demand for the regulation or the policing of conduct essentially the outlawing of name-calling or the enforcement of respect. So my argument is that anti-racism today is no longer a, a progressive issue, it is just a form of policing. So racism in football isn't, isn't, is, is essentially, or the, the debate about racism in football is the form through which policing um, takes place. In, and, and I think, you know, again, something to explore, that the, the, the relationship between the state and the citizen has been reinvented in the last two decades, and, and anti-racism um, now is, is one of the ways which the police are, are kind of re-legitimising re themselves after the Stephen Lawrence uh, uh, murder. And I think that's something that I, it's worth bringing out in the debate, but I think that, you know, what, what we've seen of both racism and anti-racism becoming distorted and, and effectively swapping places. Thank you, Dylan. Sunday. Uh, th thanks very much. Thanks for um, inviting me. Um, as was mentioned, I've managed to have allegiances, have a, a main allegiance to Everton, but um, picked up South End United on the way by uh, Moon there. I've also looked at these issues uh, as a kind of big tankish kind of person currently running British Future, which is interesting identity um, debates. I want to agree with um, something uh, Philippe just said about the progress that we make. It seems to me self-evident to anybody who went to football in this country in the 1980s or the 1990s that we made a lot of progress since there. I mean, uh, I was 10 years old in 1984 and got to go to my first football match that year. I have not badgered my dad for you know, two or three years to take me to a game at Everton, which was uh, you know about 20 miles away from where we kind of lived. And I, I didn't know why he was reluctant to kind of take me, but I did sort of work that out a few years later. So in, in some ways, uh, you know, 
that football introduced me to racism in a large scale public kind of sense. You get a bit of racism in the playground, etc. But actually, you know, thousands of people chanting, uh, you know, quite uh, you know uh, aggressive racism. Certainly, at one game at, at Goodison Park in the, in the early 90s, uh, an Arsenal were playing had four black players, and that was thought of as, as unusual at the time. And yet a large section of the crowd uh, above one of the goals, most of them seem to be chanting, shoot that nigger, for you know, a good part of the second half. That is just something that would not happen. And if I took my 15-year-old, uh, 10-year-old, whatever, like, to foot match now, they would never hear that or the uh, uh, nothing. So we, we, made, we made a lot of progress. I'm a sort of three-quarters full glass person. This is about controversies, contemporary controversies. In a way, we, we all know we made progress. So where's the controversy? I think one of the claims is maybe we didn't make that progress. Maybe we've just hidden the racism, which still exists, but the policing is there. There were good manners. People were just as racist as they were before, but they're not allowed to show it. Um, I don't think that's true. I think there's quite good evidence that um, the, the social norm of how racist uh, uh, how they, what people actually think has actually shifted as well as how they, how they behave. And the other claim is that it hasn't been eradicated, race. and of course it hasn't been eradicated, but the, on the question of scale, the Suarez and John Terry affairs, etc., are just, are just not on, on the scale of that kind of, uh, of, that kind of thing. So um, the norm shifted, and it matters that it did also, you know, we see the instance we saw in Serbia, and there was monkey chanting at White Hart Lane, uh, a few weeks ago, when Lazio visited, and not by one or two people, but by a significant part of the thing, and that that I think shows us that the levels of racism in society and in sport, in say France, Italy, uh, as Western and Southern European countries, as well as Central Eastern European countries, is higher than it is uh, in the UK and in some of the other. Uh, probably more northern West European countries because we put more effort into it in sport and in society. So I think the anti-racist norm matters. I think football helped to develop it and shift it. I think football is still a way we police it and I think it matters that we police it. But I agree we should keep it in proportion. Don't agree that you know anti-racism is now more dangerous than racism. I think that's going too far. And I think to stand up this issue, the, the argument we've just heard that anti-racism has gone too far because it's trying to do name calling. I think you've got to work out whether or not you're going to object or not object to the progress that we did make. Because actually the bananas thrown at John Barnes at Goodison Park, I mean was that just name calling or was that something we did want to we did want to move on from? I think the the creation of a public space where as a supporter, as a player you could have equal access to it without having that form of racism was an important thing to develop the defence of you know uh, not doing not worrying about racism because it's just policing manners uh, I think is either um, if it's not an actual defence of the racism and it, it was seriously a defence of the racism in the early 1980s you did have a debate you know black goals don't count uh, you know when when you know no one could support England unless they were a sort of uh, bonkers hooligan because mainly the people who went were bonkers hooligans who were properly NF and so they did chant the scores without counting the black goals. It was actually a debate about whether you were going to keep football white, keep the England team white. Once that's gone, uh, the debate is whether or not you're being too sensitive, you're going too far. The defence is, is always around sort of sledging and banter. Sledging is part of the game. All sledging is part of the game. Racist sledging is just sledging. If Arsenal have got a 19-year-old left back playing in one of his first big games, he happens to be black, you try and put him off. Why not try and put him off using the colour of his skin? I think it's a pretty poor kind of uh, defence, basically, because it's, it's, worth, it's worth doing that. Well, the argument that it's gone too far is that um, is also about this issue about class, and I think that just actually misreads. I mean, although that's supposed to be a sort of defence of the working class against the kind of cosmopolitan PC-ness of the, of the middle classes, it's actually a mistake as to where the racism was and where the racism changed, I think, to a large extent. Because the big shift in racism in British society over the last 30 years isn't actually massively about a shift where the middle class weren't racist and were less racist and the working class stayed racist. The big shift is generational. The big shift is age. <coughs> People in their 90s and their 60s in this country, middle class or working class, are much, you know, 
did hold and continue to hold all those younger, you know, more xenophobic or even hardline racist attitudes than people in their 30s and 40s were the working class or middle class. There are some class differences, there are some education differences, but actually the generational differences are the primary differences. So you have proper racism and fascism and whatever in this country, and it's often been, sometimes, it, I mean, it's tried to appeal to working class, it's mostly failed. Uh, it's often had quite a strong lower middle class component, and it's often had quite a lot of elite political uh, support from the top end of the upper middle class. So I think, I think this class uh, thing needs to be picked into. I think the other doubt about football and racism is did we focus too much on football? in terms of racism? Should we have focused more on workplaces or other things? In keeping our eye on the ball, did we take our eye off the ball? I think that's, that's the debate that is worth having. Now, it depends on thinking that there's a trade-off, that you know the energy we put into football and racism could have yet been put somewhere else, and we did a symbolic thing when we could have done a real thing. I think we should debate that. I think there's a plausible argument to make, but I doubt it, because I think football was a powerful symbolic part of our culture, which is what people were discussing in the workplace on a, on a Monday morning in West Bromwich or Newcastle or Liverpool or London. It was worth having the sort of powerful symbolic issue of football as the place where we had this conversation. I can't think of any other place we had the conversation that wasn't a trade union or a university or a student movement or, or you know, a classroom and that had mass public reach where people changed their mind about what was acceptable or not acceptable. I think if you believe that mixing and contacting, experiencing other people matters, then actually experiencing other people as your football heroes, as your fellow fans actually matter. So I doubt there was a trade-off. And when I was growing up and when John Barnes uh, scored in the Maracana and the England NF uh, contingent were chanting one mil all over the school, two mil, because they weren't counting black goals, there was still an anguished debate about whether you could be black and British, whether you could be black and English, and people didn't know what the answer would be. And we now don't know why we had a problem with the question. And I think one of the reasons we don't know why we had a problem with the question is that, is that since 1978, when Viv Anderson first played for uh, England, 90 uh, black players have played for England, one in four New England caps gone to a black player. The question has obviously been settled because we saw it settled, and the question is only contested on the extreme fringes, and that was progress worth making. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, since I'm not reading English newspapers every day, I'm not going to talk that much about John Cherry, uh, which I'm probably glad of. Um, I'm going to stop with bringing kind of the spotlight to uh, the Swedish football, or let's say the Swedish third league, where my favorite team, Örgelite IS, is now playing one of the most important games in the last decade at this very moment, uh, which is quite annoying. So if I get an SMS, you know, it's, 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 it's nothing else but a uh, result coming in. Um, of course, I would like to be there. I would like to watch that game. And if I would have been there, I would, would have behaved in a completely different way than I'm doing now. No white church, no calm, polite conversation. I would be screaming, I would be jumping, I would saying and singing rude things about the opponents and uh, eventually my own team as well because it always ends up that you the other team. Uh, because that's how football is. It's the way, what is, what we find okay at the football pitch is of course depending on social context. We do things when we watch football that we wouldn't do in another situation. Uh, there are some people that do that, people that I met in the, in the subway this morning shout, shouting like they were already at the pitch, which is of course very strange behavior in that, in, in that, uh, in that context. Uh, there should be a room for hate, there should be a room for love, there should be a room for very strong feelings in football. And that's one of the reasons why I really love football. But from my point of view, as an anti-racist, I think there is a limit. And that limit goes very clearly from my perspective when those kind of shoutings and those kind of songs is pointed uh, to the fact that people are black, uh, to the fact that people are homosexuals or cold homosexuals, uh, whatever else, religion, 
and so on. I think, for me, that's the limit. And today, in Swedish football, and as we all heard in England as well, things have changed. In Sweden, during the 90s, when I was too young for, to go to football, in games, and I was also living in a, a, a very far away from a, a town where you actually play football in the higher leagues, uh, you, you met racism. And players who played in the Swedish league uh, faced racist abuse almost every game. Uh, the situation has changed, which is great, because now the limit is quite clear. What is okay and what is not okay? And why has that limit been clear? Yeah, various reasons, I would say. One of the reasons is, of course, that football is a part of the globalization. Football is today, the Swedish league that no one cares about has football players from all over the world. The Premier League has it as well. Uh, it's almost impossible for those who were shouting racist abuse against opponents that were black, for example, they found some real big problems where the wrong players were black. This is a kind of practical problem that racism meets in, in a multicultural society. It's almost impossible to be, you have to be pragmatic as a racist. Uh, and that changes how you perceive your opponent, and that changes also the attitude of what is okay and not okay. It's a change because, at least in this Swedish uh, situation, football has been more mainstream. It's not only white, young, uh, men who goes to the football games. It's a game for everyone, it's all, which also changes the kind of attitude to what is okay and not okay to say. And it has changed because of a work that has been done. This is nothing that just, you know, happens. Uh, it changes because there has been an or organizational way of working with this kind of things, with the awareness of of, 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 of racist abuse, for example, in, in football. And I think one of the reasons why, for example, the reactions is so very uh, uh, high and loud in, in, in Great Britain is because you today have an infrastructure for dealing with racist abuse at the football pitch, which you didn't have like uh, a couple of decades ago. At least that's the situation in Sweden. Where are some of the things that we heard uh, 10 or 20 years ago suddenly occur again? We have legislations inside a football kind of uh, family. Uh, we have a media that is suddenly seeing it, and I totally agree. I think one of the reasons why it's so debated is because it's not that usual as, as it was before. As less racist we see in football, the, f the few cases of it make uh, is more clear. And we have an infrastructure for dealing with it, which you don't have, for example, in Poland or Ukraine or a lot of other countries where, where this topic isn't at all at the same level uh, of, of awareness as it is in Sweden, for example. Uh, so I think, the, in one sense, the reactions against what now I will mention him uh, anyway, John Cherry. I mean, in a sense, it's, of course, it's good. I mean, what what if no one reacted? What if what what if this was considered okay? What if we had the idea that well, he is a symbol symbol for some kind of white working class uh, people in Great Britain. So let's not react. Let him say those things, and those people that react are silly. Are dangerous. I think that is not the. I think we have to react, and I think it's good that that kind of infrastructure do exist. But I also totally agree with uh, with the argument that this can't be the only thing that we discuss when it comes to racism in the society. Uh, it's a kind of self, false self-image that we at least have in Sweden because we're kind of proud that we don't have those kind of racist abuses from the, uh, from the supporters or from the players anymore. But at the same time, yeah, there's a lot of black players. But if you look at the football organizations, there's no black people in power. There is no immigrants in power. It's led by 
white men between 40 and 65, at least in Sweden. So if you want to kind of dig into football and change football to uh, something uh, that is open for everyone, you have to look at parts of the football, uh, football family that deals with power as well. And I think that is a discussion that we don't have because if we don't, because if we do have that discussion, that points to other things in society as well, where the relation, the kind of power relationships, looks the same. Um, yeah, I'm almost sent off here, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. Oh, okay. Um, Again, thank you for inviting me and the rest of it, and uh, the normal football confessionals. I'm glad that we're not playing at home because I'd be there, I wouldn't be here, but that's um, just the sad truth, I'm afraid. In terms of the, the, the subject, I nearly said de under debate, but it doesn't seem like a debate because it sounds like we're, they're pretty close in our opinions. Um, I mean, personally, um, the Suarez, the John Terry didn't really kind of keep me up at night. You think, oh, okay, well, not a great surprise, uh, unpleasant, but in the grand scheme of things, not such a big deal. Um, with a sociological, I suppose, hat on um, and teaching uh, race, if you like, a few things struck me as worth perhaps um, saying. I suppose one is, is the kind of fashionable and the normal uh, sociological kind of uh, ploy of um, crime complexity. You know, which is, could be seen as self-serving. If, if it was simple, you wouldn't need us, not that you need us particularly. But, so instead of talking about racism, it, you know, the, the fashionable sociological move would be to pluralise and talk about racisms. That's already been alluded to in, in some of the, what the speakers have said. And I suppose one of the obvious kinds of distinctions one traditionally would draw, and not just theoretically, but in, in law as well, is the distinction between kind of, you know, um, direct racism, uh, the kind that was outlawed in the original kind of race relations legislation, where it was all about intention, and structural institutional racism, uh, which, which came in in the, in the later kind of race relations act, which is all about effects and not at all about intentions. So in a sense, you've got this, you've got this kind of contrast between kind of, you know, um, and what the John Terry and, and what we're talking about, I suppose, alludes to is the attempt to kind of police and manage that kind of direct, intentional, uh, name-calling uh, prejudice. So it's racism as prejudice is, is the thing that, that is you know, being talked about in the John Terry case and the Suarez case, those kind of things. But what's not really addressed at all, or very much, um, or is the last thing that, that might be mentioned, is the institutional angle. In a sense, that's the anxiety that I have, in a sense, is that the, you know, the intentional direct racism, which has much reduced, and again, turning to the confessional mode, you know, um, I only started going to the Arsenal in the kind of mid-80s, but I suppose that shows how old I am now, but that seems like relatively recent to me. Um, and and it, wasn't, it wasn't as bad as other clubs, because there were, there were a few more black players than I think maybe other clubs. Although there was the, the deep shame of Arsenal, which was you had the yin chant, and you still have it, but much, much less. Um, and that's, you know. So I think, I think, as the other speakers have said, I think things have got better in terms of kind of like the, the obvious nature of kind of racism and that kind of day to day, you, you can experience it at the kind of individual level. Uh, that's, that's much reduced. Um, and I suppose, in terms of looking at kind of anti racism and anti racist politics, I suppose, uh, again with sociological hat, I see it as kind of. Um, sensible in the sense of a kind of move, if you like, a kind of depoliticization that, that we've had over the years, from anti-racism being all about politics and radical change, you know, come the revolution, racism will be eradicated. And the way it's, it's turned into a kind of management thing, it's something you do training on, you go on courses for awareness and that kind of stuff. So you're a kind of uh, a managerial anti-racism is kind of taking the place of a kind of political project, largely. So, you know, that, that um, committee report, you know, you see all the traces that you see kind of like, you know, and, it, you know, governance, there's the, the state deals with this at arm's length, it's kind of called statecraft. So, you know, traditionally the central state um, 
managed to kind of make race safe by leaving it to the local authorities to deal with and secure race, you know, good race relations. And the same way you have that in, in the responses to the John Terry and racism in football, you have a kind of government states so that PFA, the FA, UEFA, FIFA, all these kinds of stuff, they kind of deal with it. Um, in terms of football, I suppose, as some of the others uh, have mentioned, you know, football is very much about emotion. It's, it's also interesting, I think, in terms of race and migrants and ethnic minorities, very much about local identification. <coughs> because you know, it's about performance, you kind of go, you, you're, you're a fan, and uh, in my own experience, for me it was always about club, not country. The logic is quite different in terms of club football where you, know, you can become one of us, you can perform, be a fan, become a fan. Whereas the, the entry into the national thing, and whether you belong, you know, the, the famous thing, you know, there's no black in the Union Jack, although of course that's, that's, that's become rather commonplace now, because there seem to be like, you know, masses of blacks in the Union Jack, and that seems to become the norm, which is good. But the, the club country kind of contrast is, is um, it's still life, but it, it, it makes it interesting the, the issue about the kind of a Serbian punch up. Because now it's an offence to the country that the Serbians have dissed the under 21 team. Because, you know, it's not us and them now, you know, because they're, they're, you know, there are blacks in the Union. Yeah. Um, so, to conclude, before I get shown my little yellow card, I suppose the things I wanted to talk about. Um, or, end up with. I suppose looking at kind of anti-racism of football, I think one of the interesting things is the way that, um, as I said before, I think the, the move to, it makes it sound rather kind of like it was a plan, but to deep, the depoliticization of anti-racist kind of politics and anti-racism becoming from a big political project to being rather more modest and perhaps more, you might argue, realistic kind of managerial kind of um, thing. I thought it was very interesting the way that football, because it was so prominent, and spectacular, literally spectacular, did a lot of the work. It was very, very visible, and it seemed to be, you know, at the, at the, at the, at the it was in the kind of vanguard of anti-racism, if you like. So, which is another reason <coughs> for the problems with John Terry and the Serbian and that kind of stuff. Um, and I suppose, well, actually, that's the last thing I suppose is just that anxiety that I started with. You know, you've got kind of individual face-to-face -face racism, you've got the, the whole kind of project to kind of police that and manage that and, and move to a kind of colour-blind default <laughs> position. But then you've got the argument that in a sense the trouble with that is that it ignores the structural and you have a gap, so you have a kind of de facto default kind of colour-blind uh, set of rules that we, that we use in polite civilised company. But the, the fact of structural disadvantage which, which stays and is, and is difficult to change, that isn't dealt with, and you have a gap. It's what, it's what um, some people like Vanilla Silva and the States call colour-blind racism. So you've got, you've got racism, the effects of racism in the past, um, but you haven't got the racists, so you've got this kind of gap. Okay, thanks. Thank you to our panellists. I'll just ask them quickly if they'd like to respond to what other people have said, and then we'll take questions and points from the audience. Just, um, I mean, I don't think I was saying, um, you know, ignore race, racist abuse. I think it, racist abuse on the pitch or in the stand should be settled informally, should be dealt with informally. I, I mean, I, I think it's quite important that if players are, so, you know, if, if John Terry said what he said, then the, the other players on the pitch have to deal with it and either kind of demand an apology or punch it. <laughs> um, off the ball justice. Um, if it's done in the stands, you know, but most most fans aren't racist, so deal with the racism. Why can't 30, 40,000 fans, most of whom aren't racist, deal with the small minority? It's much better um, than, than demanding that the police take action because there are all sorts of consequences to inviting the state to deal with bad language. You know, you, you, it, it, it corrodes free speech, ultimately. You know, you, you can't have policemen policing name calling. What sort of society is that where name calling is outlawed? Yeah, yeah. So it's much better if you deal with it collectively and, and informally without relying on states. Really. Uh, um, well, just on, on that specific point, I think you have to do both. I think it is better if you do it informally. Actually, the, the only time uh, I remember you know, overt racism at South End. Game against Wolves and South End fan line goal using 
man for child. You know, someone ever supports his test and says, Oi, mate, what's Andy Ansar going to make of that? To refer to his own centre forward. So the sort of pragmatism of the racing. But it also matters, you know, if you're at Arsenal and like, everyone else is thinking, actually, we don't really want to do a Holocaust chance anymore. You've got someone shouting, you know, like, Holocaust chance is one person. If you're settling it informally, you say, Excuse me, mate, would you mind with the old Holocaust chance? It's not very nice. Because actually, I'm quite keen on it myself. I'm trying to recruit people to whatever kind of group. There's then, at some point, got to be a rule that says, like, can you say to the old steward, actually, the old Holocaust chanting that we're not doing? Because if you settle it informally, actually, you know, 1% of the crowd can continue to actually toxify the staging and see, you know, all the other things. And, you know, where the boundary is, does the boundary cover, you know, sectarianism in Scotland, does it cover Munich and Hillsborough chants for Liverpool play Man United, etc. In fact, we've got to decide that civically, but when we do decide it civically and we don't put it in the wrong place, and I think putting it in the wrong place would, would wreck the anti-racist norm in a way. If you have to turn every ground into a total sort of, you know, library of prayer in order to not do it. The, you know, the question is, put the band in the right place, but have a bit of backup. Uh, yeah, and I think basically that is, if you look at Sweden, what's happened, the change is, is because of that. It's because uh, uh, supporter groups taking responsibility of what, it, of what is said on the stands, basically. Uh, with a very clear uh, idea of creating a welcoming, uh, uh, a welcoming uh, atmosphere at the pitch, and well, and racism isn't welcoming, basically. Uh, so it's something in Sweden that is mainly done inside the football family and inside inside the football support groups, which I think is, of course, the best way to do it. But sometimes it can be uh, uh, nice when, you, when you're trying to change something to have something to lean on as well, you know. We can't say this because there is actually a rule here or there is a legislation that we can actually point to. Um, and I also, one other thing which is interesting at the moment from a Swedish perspective, but it seems like that in, in Great Britain as well, that football is nowadays becoming more and more the kind of symbol for the multicultural society. If you look at the Swedish national team, it consists of people with backgrounds from almost all over the world. And in a, in a country where we are afraid of waving flags like we are in Sweden, the national football team is, is, is giving an opportunity to kind of be nationalistic, proud of Sweden, without the fear of getting misunderstood. Uh, and the national team also reflects the kind of change in the Swedish society. So in that case, from my point of view, it seems like football have, have almost changed into a weapon when it comes to describing modern society, when it comes to describing the fact that we can be different but play in the same team. Uh, it's a very uh, the symbolic language of football is very useful and maybe that's also one of the reasons why people because well I guess that it's not only uh, the kind of police that have reacted on John Cherry I guess there is ordinary people as well who don't think that what he said is okay uh, and that is also maybe because of an idea of what football should be and uh, uh, football as something Open and welcoming. Yeah, not, not really much to add to it, I think. It'd be good to hear what the audience have to say about this. But I, I think that, that point about the, the spectacular nature of football and the mega events, I mean, obviously, we've just come off the Olympics and the Euros and that kind of stuff. And the fact that it's almost anachronistic, you know, we're, we're, we're confessing like actually going to football, where for the majority of people, they don't go to football, they see it on the telly. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's, it's you know, that kind of privileged situation of actually being at a live event where it's increasingly kind of mediated. But it does have that kind of spectacular kind of aspect to it. But anyway, I'm going to shut up now and let you ask a question. Okay, lots of hands. So, so somebody got a microphone? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the chap just here with the red wristband. Then we'll go forward. Thank you. Um, and, uh, um, John Terry, um, now I'm, I'm a, 
first of all, Police Park Rangers, and I was there on, on, on the day um, that he was alleged to have said um, remarks he made to one of the people like company to, um, to Anton Ferdinand. Now, it really does hurt this case. I think John Terry has been dealt um, a, a severe blow and um, uh, and, and judged un, un, harsh, uh, judge harshly. Um, I think that not only um, the criticism about um, what, what he was uh, said to have said um, impact upon um, um, the policing of football and matches, and we can see from now on, or increasingly, that that will happen, um, where stewards and police will start throwing people out when they call it. I also think it has a huge effect on what justice is, the judicial process. John Terry went to court, was found not guilty, and then goes to um, uh, uh, the FA and they find him guilty and find him 300 pounds. 300,000 pounds, sorry. So that makes so we have the, the things there, the, 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 the justice. Okay, uh, we'll come up over here and then we'll go over to the side. Yeah. That's fine, yeah. I just wanted to ask the panel, um, when we're talking about name calling and racism in football, what do they think about the Rio Ferdinand issue of him calling um, Ashley Cole Chalk Ice and the fact that ostensibly a black player is now going to be um, labelled a racist? Has, has that not, does that not seem really weird? <laughs> maybe, maybe in front of it, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, there's two pieces. Okay, yeah. And this is the point for the leap, a couple of points in fact, the first of which is um, the pitch is a workplace. In your workplace, as a line manager, would you tolerate one of your staff calling them something else and then fucking them, whatever Ferdinand had said? Um, and the other point is you said that uh, black people or black men are disproportionately represented on the pitch, which is true. Where are all the Asians? Okay, uh, okay, person behind, I'll tr just try to take a load of people and it will come back. And there is, I don't think there's a consensus on the panel, but if somebody wants to puncture the consensus that it is, then, uh, yeah, feel free. A few points and then a question. Um, I think supporting your country now is a sort of summer sport for most uh, Premier League supporters because international is completely getting in the way and your player might be injured, you know, to the point where I wish I would have a lot. It's also gone out of the bounds of your country because my country's any team uh, that my players play for. So I'm disappointed that Ivory Coast won last week because that means Jovino's going to be out for a month. You know, why was I supporting or not supporting Ivory Coast? It gets very complex. Um, I don't like this idea of this link of working class with racism because I think if there's one group in society that have actually lived done something about racism, it is the white working class of this country because they are educated, they work, they live, they shop. And I think all the commentators are all the people that don't have anything to do with the groups that they're supposedly uh, discussing racism about. So I'd love to have the whole white working class argument out of it. On the sense of whether there's racism or not, I mean it is very appropriate to say the numbers playing for, but it's also just as important as the colleague in front has discussed about Asians, but also you know, no position, very few positions of authority, in other words, management and coaches. But I am really confused on a day when obviously what well, I'm hoping for is the results uh, at 5.30 today, that's the main thing on my mind. But the other thing that everybody's been talking about today is the fact that Rio Ferdinand didn't wear a t-shirt. What does it mean? The kick it out t-shirt. And neither Swansea, none of Swansea and Wigan did. I'm just intrigued that the whole discussion before the matches was all about t-shirts and I do find a bit of a difficult leap from t-shirts to real what I would consider anti-racism so I want some help in that complex idea, thanks. Okay. Let me hear and then we'll go to the other side. Hi, I just wanted to um, say something about what sort of image the Ferdinand Ferdinand um, football is portraying and I completely take if we're saying that football is a powerful, symbolic part of our culture, which I think one of the panel members said, so what do what are we saying when, although black players are overrepresented, we don't see many black captains. We don't see black captains on the pitch, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, what is it saying? What are we saying to people when John Terry, when he's under investigation, in any other workplace would be suspended 
and wasn't, and was allowed to persist playing um, in a position of captain at Chelsea. What does that actually say about the, the game? At a, at a very high <coughs> level, this is not about individual instances on the pitch. This is not about individual instances in an audience. This is, this, I think this is quite a deep philosophical question for football. Um, and finally, would you agree, if you think things have got to be settled on the pitch, would you also agree with Seth Blatter that we settle things with a handshake afterwards? Because to me, that, that, I, mean, I found that really, really quite, quite shocking, that from the top, that, what that says to people is incidents are being trivialised. That's, that's what it says. Yeah, I'll get the panel to come back quickly on some of these points, and I'll go out to the other side. I think you might want to talk about the workplace argument. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd apply the same. Yeah, football is a workplace, but I think in a workplace, racism needs to be, well, expressions of racism need to be settled informally by employees. And I've done this myself. You know, I used to, in, in a different life, I used to be a trade union rep in the civil service. I had people um, who, <coughs> who used racist language. What I did was I took the woman who's, who did that and um, the, the black employee who, who was offended by it and sat him down and we talked about it and she apologised. It's not that difficult, you know. And I think it's much better than become, making it into a demand for regulation or a sackable offence. It's much better that white working class people see that they have com a common interest in combating racism. Racism isn't a sin, it's a set of ideas. And, you know, if you take it out of the realm of a set of ideas and make it sinful, make, him some, make it something to be taboo and banned and not spoken about, um, you, you absolve people of the responsibility for challenging those ideas. And I think that it's much better to have the ideas out in the open, freely expressed and challenged. Okay, uh, uh, quick point some people want to make, otherwise carry on. I'll do the chalk ice. Yeah. I think the chalk ice thing is interesting because in a sense, I think one of the problems with thinking about doing kind of anti-racist politics was that for years we suffered from a very simplistic view of race and racism. Racism is something that white people did to blacks, blacks were automatically victims, whites were automatically perpetrators and, and in the worst versions of this you had the options that well, white people could either put their hands up and admit it or they were in denial. You know, and it was, it was a really unhelpful political kind of formulation. I mean, the other side of it was, I think the first person that got done under, under uh, one of the racial relations that was a, a, a black character, you know, in the same... Michael X. Yeah, well, Michael X says his own, he should have got more than done for that. I mean, yeah, yeah, just don't need to get into Michael X. But, um, so I think it's, I think the chalk ice thing is, not debating the rights and wrongs of it, but I mean, I think in a sense it's interesting because it exposes the fact that racism is not a one-way street and that it's more complicated. But again, I'm, I'm playing sociological complexity card. Okay. Yeah, it's good to have some common sense sociology there on that question. Because um, uh, is this being taped? <laughs> I mean, there was there was you know black people can't be racist; yes. they don't have the power to be racist, and that is a real problem for common sense anti-racism, where you can't say plague on both houses. All these examples, actually, more these examples going this way. Uh, and you know, Chuck Isis, I think, I mean, in that case, he was responding to a tweet and laughing at it. You know, might not have given it due thought. It's a pretty terrible. Kind of thing to say. It's a real policing of you know yeah. black people, what identity black people are allowed to have. Um, I wanted to just do the where the Asians point uh, quickly. Um, it's interesting because I'm not sure anyone's really got a clear reason as to what's going on. There are different possible arguments, you know, all of which are partially true. So part of it is actually you know there aren't that many middle class footballers. And so Asian parents who are sort of middle class, aspirational around education and so on, you know, don't want their kids to be taking the risk of sport as opposed to education, which is true of middle class Asian parents generally. It's not true then of uh, poor Pakistani and Bangladeshi kids who would resemble the um, type of people from black backgrounds who get onto it. Look at Team GB. Uh, going outside of football, um, and uh, British Future looked at you know lots of issues about diversity there, and you know actually a, a third of the medals can be attributed to one of the last three waves of immigration since 1948 Olympics. But there aren't any Asian athletes in Team GB. You can get up to two out of 560 if you kind of like really like playing quite hard on the second one. <laughs> Someone uh, and so, but actually people didn't even notice, including like the Asian media and so on, barely noticed it. I thought, but now it's not that 
you know, whether it's important or not, it's important if there are either, you know, not fair chances or there are barriers to it. And it's worth just saying what are the what are the what are the barriers going on there? There were a lot of Asian fans actually in the stadium and so on and kids, and it might be a generational thing. I mean it's partly um, I mean <coughs> parenting, I mean there are cultural factors actually where particularly around uh, uh, <coughs> girls and women, some people might have a cultural aversion type of sport. There are also just pressures on kids if you say you've got a family business or something, you don't want kids, but actually turn your kid into a sports star also requires not just not being a barrier, it requires mad levels of parental commitment for every weekend of their lives, the first 15 years of their lives. And actually, some people might not know that, might think that you know your kids just get picked up by school. So keep an eye on it, I think, and watch out for it. But if it doesn't change, then there's a, there's a, there's a problem. Just, just briefly, just to come back to your point about the, the captains, although in a sense, as I said, it didn't really keep me up at night, but I think, I think the, the, the hesitation that Liverpool showed not coming out and, and sorting Suarez out. The, the whole kind of ambiguity about Chelsea, the captaincy and JT and this kind of stuff. It, I think it does beg the question about lip service, basically. So I think, I think that's, a, that's a, an important kind of question. Because as I said, I think the, it's interesting that the anti-racism has become the kind of default position. I mean, in a sense, the thing about it moving from politics to managerialism, you know, it's good and bad. I mean, in a sense, the success is that it's, it's ubiquitous. You know, all organisations now pretty much declare themselves to be anti-racist, equal opportunities and all that kind of stuff. But those episodes uh, beg the question about how far that's superficial. Really. Yeah, maybe a comment about the thing about name calling. From my perspective, the problem with saying something rude to something based on a racist idea is not the fact of course, it's a the problem that you're rude, uh, but uh, it's not the manner in itself, it's not your behavior that is the problem. The problem is the idea behind what you're saying. And I think we're stuck in a situation, at least in Sweden, and it sounds like you have it here as well, when you're, when you're pointing fingers trying to find racists, people that are racists. And that is not interesting. It's interesting to find to figure out what, what are the ideas that people are expressing. And I think that is a problem overall with, with anti-racism, that it's easier to discuss it when someone says something ugly uh, and don't discuss the idea of what, about what, what makes it ugly. In Sweden, for example, we don't discuss racism inside football. That's not the symbol that, that is used for discussing racism. What we have is a it's a, it's a far-right party in the parliament called the Sweden Democrats, which is somewhere, somewhere kind of uh, every discussion about racism has comes from their existence in, in the parliament, and people are talking about the, their uh, voters and their party members as racists, which is not interesting. The interesting is, of course, to figure out the ideas behind the party or the ideas that have actually led to the success of the party. And I think this is a difference, not to find racists, but to find the ideas and understand the ideas. And one way of understanding them is, of course, that a black, people, a black man can, of course, also be a racist. OK, so there's a load of hands. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll go down. Is that the microphone? Yeah, yeah so we'll go down this way. OK, Sid, uh, Sid, uh, Sid. You make the point that uh, you're all in agreement, there's not really a debate. Let me give you a debate. Okay, here we go. Uh, first of all, a little aside to the woman about step ladder. Yes, a handshake was the right response. A handshake would sort of end the step ladder. But a couple of quick things. First point, anti-racist initiatives are an absolute inverse proportion to the problem of racism. So when racism was a problem, where were all these kicking out and show racism red card? Now it's not a problem. You have a whole plethora of anti-racist initiatives. And your man David James is absolutely right. It's a little gravy train, a self-fulfilling industry. Go and get a job. All those anti-racist people in football, you're not needed. Second thing, <laughs> do look is right. Do not conflate name calling with racism. I play Max football. I'm not playing today. I'm here for the bottle of ideas. I get called an Irish cunt, a Scottish fucker, because they can't work out my accent. <laughs> what happens is, after the game, the people who call me those names, 
Uh, we're in ba often by being with beer, down here, beer, the home, the club that we play against, put on sandwiches, soup, blah blah blah, everything's hunky dory, self bladdered right again, handshake, move on, not a problem, sledging, you're right, that's what it's called, you wind each other up on the football pitch, if you don't like it on the pitch, if you don't like it in the stadium, don't go, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. What we have here is with anti-racist uh, etiquette and anti-racist initiatives is moralising. What we have is contempt for a lot of ordinary work class football fans. And as an Irish person, may I defend English working class guys who go to football? Because that's where a lot of this anti-racist bollocks is aimed at. They're, they, they, you know, they're, they're like seen as a public order problem waiting to happen. And that's what most of this anti-racist stuff is about. Next thing, let's do something really simple. Make a distinction between words and actions. Simple as that. You can call a person whatever you want on a football pitch at the game. As far as I'm concerned, as a Celtic fan, I, wanna, I, wanna, I defend the right to say fuck the Queen, fuck the Huns. I defend the right to say fuck the Pope, Kelly Clark, <laughs> all the rest of it, 100%, right? Because I realise that often footballs are like a pantomime, right? You, you let off steam, you walk out the gate and that's the end of it. And what's happened is these anti-racist campaigners are like lunatics who've taken over the asylum. 100% flawed and problematic. Next quick we think social contacts. Let's talk about the social contacts. Read my lips. Racism is not a problem. In Britain, at the football, racism is not a problem. See, if you want to talk about the social contacts and you want to do something productive, don't go on about what uh, John Terry says or Suarez. Join me in, in campaigns and protests outside asylum detention centres in Oxford. Campaign against racist immigration freaking laws instead of slobbering and moaning about name calling. I live in a parallel universe to these people who want to go on and make an issue of name calling. Completely different planets and galaxies we live on. So please let's have a bit about this. Almost finished. Okay. Well, <laughs> it's, in the football. it's like pornography. I actually think it's like a type of pornography. They look for it everywhere. And what's really interesting, the examples that are dredged up are always about 25 or 30 years old. How we ever got to this state of affairs, my God, is such an unhealthy, sick situation where we are at. Our football in this country has never been better, and yet we want to pathologize it, we want to make problems where they don't exist. What's driving it, in my opinion, is snobbery, elitism, and contempt for the people who go to the football. They're, it's a place where government and others in the forest can't quite control them. There's an element of the unpredictability about it, and we need to regulate it, we need to control it, and the consequences of that are always authoritarian, and they make the problem worse. Final sentence, okay. just, in case you get me, just in case you can get me, anti-racism does more harm than good when you're talking about the football. Shout out tomorrow, right? <laughs> <laughs> Person from. Yeah, um, Stuart Wayton, I'm glad there's a decent audience here because I'm launching my book called <laughs> Sports Law Criminalising Football Fans in an Age of Intolerance, which is tomorrow uh, at uh, about half three, I think. 3 3.15, very good. So I'll see you all there. And I'll sign the sign copies personally. Um, yeah, how can you follow that from Kevin? Kevin's chairing the session, so I might, I might get a word of an entrance tomorrow. Yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in this in terms of the what I would describe as cosmopolitan myths, because it's, it's interesting when you look back in the 1970s when you would have moral panics about things like black mugging. And I went through the report recently, the report that, uh, on racism in football, uh, which said that racism is still a problem in football. And I scrubbed out the words football fan and put in black mother. Uh, and if you, if you read that report in that way, you would think it was prejudiced, elitist, vile, hateful, uh, and all the rest of it. Because football fans now, white world class football fans in particular, I genuinely believe are treated in that profoundly prejudiced way uh, where they are seen uh, almost as scum. In terms of the basic lack of freedoms and rights that you have as a football fan, in terms of being searched, uh, in terms of things that you can and can't say, in terms of life bans, you get life bans for various things. You know, does, the, does this happen at the opera? Uh, it doesn't seem to. It's just, it is a remarkable level of policing uh, that takes place. And 
the woman over there uh, said, said it nicely, I think she said, bladder. What message does that send out? And it's this kind of idea that if somebody says something that isn't the official anti-racist line, Jesus, what will those people out there think? If, can these football fans be given uh, an idea that might be seen as racist, that might be slightly alternative to the official line? That seems profoundly problematic to me, that we have this idea of what does that say? as if we can't have more than one idea about a question, fundamentally because we don't trust people uh, to listen to different ideas uh, about this issue. It's, there's, a, there's a kind of hysterical cosmopolitan form of elitism today, specifically or, uh, organized around football. Uh, I think, just a couple of final points, I think we, we, we saw how this works when, I can't remember which World Cup it was, the European Cup, when Beckham and other captains of football teams were reading out this sort of scripted mantra that they are against racism, which I thought was you know, profoundly Stalinist almost in terms <laughs> of the, you know, that they had to read this and say this and we must be taught and that's really just saying, look, we, we've got this captive audience. We must read this script because God knows what they're going to do. It's like it, it really is there's a borderline hysterical sense about the crowd out there, which I think is profoundly unjustified. Seen, that's final point, seen, I think, probably best in the Panorama program, Stadium of Hague, where they went to the Ukraine and Poland, basically said, uh, this place is, is, is almost a, a fascist cauldron waiting to explode. There's racism everywhere, racist chants, and so on. And yet, the European Championships passed with almost no incident, uh, as far as I can see. So there is a kind of profoundly problematic panic approach to me uh, around this issue uh, of racism in football, which I, I do think is a, a, akin to an old-fashioned type moral panic, but it's now being done by cosmopolitan uh, elites uh, who seem to refuse to leave football alone. Okay, well, there's lots and lots of hands. I'm going to take, if people want to come back from the panel, I'll take a few more from here, then I'll take the panel briefly, and then we'll try and get everybody in, if you go quickly, but Yes, a gentleman here and then a the lady there. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, my name's Paul and I'm a Watford supporter. I'm very qualified to talk on, on football. And I, I actually. <laughs> 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 uh, as I when, I, uh, when I carry on, the other one is actually at the game at the moment. So, but I did want to mention something that's actually taking place right now, seems as we're having this uh, discussion. But, in the context of, of the fact that I think this whole debate, this whole debate, whichever side of this debate people seem to be on, is absolutely focused now on racism being defined as actions of players, words, and hence, quite rightly, criticism of um, whether, uh, criticism from this, the discussion here as to whether it, it's making a point whether a t shirt is worn or whether a stupid script is, is read out. And I just want to uh, mention that my son's at the game at Watford today. Watford have played Peterborough. Peterborough have about 2,000 supporters at the game, which is about 1,400 more than they usually take. Um, there is a great big uh, flag of St. George being flown with the letters EDL uh, written across it. And at least seven or 800 chanting uh, the name of Tommy Sheridan, who is the leader of the EDL. And I just think that we need to Robson's and Tim Lecture. No, he goes under the pseudonym of Terry Tommy Sheridan, yeah, yeah. Oh, which is a, from football. It, it is a, 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 a name of a Luton Town believer in the, the 70s. So he uses that pseudonym. It's not his real man. Uh, now, it might, might just be that it's just to do with the Watford Luton uh, rivalry that, uh, that exists. But I just wanted to make that point that actually these people know it's hit racism out there, and they're making their span deliberately. Uh, today. And I think if we just bury ourselves in the debate about players' language, shaking hands at the end of matches, and what's the phrase, um, dealing with racism informally, we actually miss the point that there's a group of people right here, right, right at the match today, at a game that nobody would have predicted there would be any, any trouble, who are making a very clear statement that what, what they see as a purpose of football to do. And, Let's just not forget that. Let's not get too complacent. And, you know, as a Watford supporter, I demand that my club does something about it. I demand that the players who play for my club do something about that. And most of all, I demand that the supporters do. And I just don't see how I can ever get that without having that infrastructure, which unfortunately, with all its faults, kick racism out 
goodbyes for people. Thank you. First, of all, two people next to you quickly, and then we'll have a panel briefly, and then we'll have another one final round. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I started by putting my hand up in the beginning. Now a lot has been said. Um, I'm a bit, I don't know what to say now. Um, but I would like to say one thing. Um, I like football. I'm not a supporter of any particular team. But I think that, you know, with being a public figure and um, even the benefits of it, including the financial ones, you have responsibility. And um, if you say something in front of, you know, uh, you know, millions, I guess, of people, you have to be accountable for your words. And I, I think that calling racist remarks, um, name calling, is perpetuating racism. And I, I don't see how that can help anyone. I, I, I do agree that that can come on the side also. Um, but we do need good examples to follow. And we know that footballers, like you know, so many other public figures, that is part, that has to be part of their agenda. And if not, I, I do think that needs to be put in there. Okay, the person next to you. Um, I do agree with the two gentlemen over there, but I want to put, it, put the question that um, everybody on the panel talked about how far we've come from the days of banana throwing and stuff like that, banana peel throwing. But could it not be that as the generations have changed, racism has changed as well, and it has evolved into name calling? Not to say that it is it, name calling is something that it, it, I do believe in freedom of speech and you can say what you want to say, but people should look at the idea that racism can evolve just as we as people can evolve. Thank you. I'll get the panel to come back briefly. Some particular points. Yeah. I would like to say something about this working class thing that is apparently causing some reactions here. Since I'm self uh, 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 look from, from the countryside, uh, working class family, uh, I really don't get this. I mean, it sounds like the working class is a group of people who thinks and acts in exactly the same way. When I go to a football game, the people from the working class that I stand there with is people shouting stupid things, some of them shout, nobody is shouting racist things, uh, different things. Uh, some of the people react, some of the people don't. Uh, the struggle and, and the kind of change that we see in, in Swedish football is because Swedish working class people don't like racism. They don't like, they don't, they, they, they think it's, uh, they don't want to have that on the pitch, they don't want to have it in the sense. Uh, so I can't see this kind of picture that is, that is given here, that the working class is a group of people that just, you know, want to shout and scream anything or everything, and every attempt of, of, of trying to problematize that is caused it's, it's done from some kind of cosmopolite uh, elite. I don't think that. Uh, from, from my contribute, from in the work that Expo Foundation does, we don't work at the football stadiums. We do work at working places. We are at schools. We're meeting people every day. And we're trying to discuss and change the Swedish society into what we feel about and believe is a better society. And uh, what, what we see is that one of the things that people do discuss is football. Football is not kind of, football is connected to people's daily life. So what happens in football and how we re react in football is important. And when, when people don't take responsibility and, because I totally agree, people, a, a per, fo professional football player do have responsibility. And if, if nobody reacts on that, for example, a racist abuse, that will have consequences on the floor, on working places, in schools. So I can't see how that is separated from each other. Maybe Great Britain and Sweden are very different. Maybe, maybe it's just the political elite here trying to, to tell the working class what to do. But that's not the case in Sweden. In, in, in the case in Sweden is that the Swedish working class is consisting of a lot of different ideas about how society should look like and what, what is okay to say and not. Yeah, I, I think it's an important point. I mean, white working class is a label projected onto the white working class by media 
commentators, there haven't been that many studies, there have been some where you talk to, you know, groups white where you ask people about whether they identify with it, actually they do not identify with the way that it is projected actually, you know, there is a working class that is broader than white, uh, there are, you know, and all of that, so I think, you know, in a way the defence of white working class based on defending them, using the stereotype that they're all racist and they're not allowed to be racist anymore, um, I worry about that. Um, the point that anti-racist campaigning, t-shirt anti-racism, I think there's a lot in this point, and that anti-racist campaigning I think now does need to move somewhere different, instead of hoping it can still fight the battles of the 1980s, and if they came back it would know what to do. It should actually think about the way in which things are evolved. So I do think the sort of UEFA statements and all that, that does just strike me as quite pointless uh, and, 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 and not useful. There are other types of you know, as, as it gets sort of smaller and harder with what's still left, actually different things are needed to do it. And so I think, I think anti-racism, in a sense, is too tied to wishing the old battles would come back. Um, and so, you know, I think it's doing too much of that. But the evolution point I just want to pick up on, which relates to the EDL question, is quite tricky as well. Because um, uh, the EDL, you know, we should worry about it. We should also worry about how much we worry about it. Uh, the EDL has never yet had a protest of more than 3,000 people, uh, which is the, the big one they had in Luton, had 3,000 people at it. So, you know, at their very, very biggest, they're about as half the size of a Division II football match. And until they can turn out a Division II football match, the amount of front pages we should give them about the way in which they're going to sort of represent everybody. But it's quite interesting, but there's a, there's a trick there in terms of what they're doing, because if they're just chanting EDL, uh, and they're trying to prove they don't have the speech to do it. You know, they're putting up the, the point. Now, what people think of, there would be a market for populist, uh, uh, populist sort of nationalism that was very worried about Muslims. Uh, and there's quite a big market for it. And there's a session on this a bit later. It's quite a big market for it, but it will always fail if people believe it's racist or believe it's violent. Because even the people who want populist nationalism that's worried about Muslims want to know that they're not being offered the racist or violent part of it, apart from the few people who actually want the racist or violent kind of part of it. And the EDL has failed to do this. Uh, there's some work by the Extremist Project, and they produced a poll, and about a third of people have heard of the EDL, enough to say something about it. And three quarters of them think it's not racist. I uh, don't think it is racist. And the people who think it's racist are saying nothing to do with me. And the people who like it believe it when it says it's not racist. And so they think that it's just worried about Muslims on. So we've got to be, in a way, the anti-racist norm is, is doing some good work there. Because people are actually saying, you know, and the football hooliganism, the fact that Tommy Robinson or whatever he's called, you know, does get banned a lot from football, is one of the reasons that you think, you know, that not violent thing, you do seem to get a lot of afraid charges with old Newton Town or whatever it is. So, um, it needs a subtler response because it's sort of trying to be a bit cleverer. But the way in which it's trying to be cleverer appears to have failed because most people think it's the same thing back with a slightly subtler argument. Okay, good. Yeah, I mean, Sid, Sid made an interesting point which hasn't really been picked up in the debate, which is about the kind of shift in how we understand what racism is from, from a political issue to a, a centrist or managerial one. I mean, I, I think it's, it's undergone a number of shifts in the 80s and then again in the 90s. And I think what, if, you were, if you were an anti-racist in the 70s or 80s, you, you would be focusing mainly on the state and the government because the, the, the debate about immigration was, was a national debate and that was the way that um, you know, the, the, the immigration was problematised. Black people were seen as a problem taking out jobs. And it was a, it was, the immigration debate was profoundly political and divisive. Um, and, and the, the, the state, the government, the immigration authorities had the power to, to, to control, to deny people freedom of movement, to detain them, to deport them, to deny them equal rights. Um, the police were harassing <coughs> black youth, criminalising them. The whole mugger um, discussion has kind of been forgotten, but you know, the, the concept of muggings was essentially created by policing, policing of, of black communities. And, and most anti-racists were focused on that. Even where there was racist violence, the focus was often on the police for not taking it seriously or for criminalising um, agents in Bradford for self-defence. You know? So it was, it was always the state that was seen as the problem. And, 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 the, and racism, even if it wasn't kind of overt name-calling racism, it was official state policy or national, that kind of nationalism. And we've seen a shift from where state racism has been official state policy to where post-McPherson it's, it's become um, official 
anti-racism has become state policy. And, and it's also undergone a transformation, so it's ceased to be seen as a political problem. It's now seen as a, a psychological problem. You know, it's something in your, in your head, and it's something in your mind. It's unwitting racism. So that even the concept of institutionalized, institutional racism has undergone a change. And in, in the 70s and 80s, it was institutions which were, were performing a particular function in society, like the police and the immigration service, were seen as racism because were seen as racist because of what they did, not because of the canteen culture. Post McPherson, it was the ordinary Bobby on the beat and their prejudices which which um, were problematized. That's what institutional racism has, has become. It's you know ordinary people, prejudice emanating from their psyche rather than from the way society is organized. And I think that shift is something which we haven't really discussed, but that's that's kind of behind us. So that's why football ends up being seen as the focus for anti-racism today, because it because if you if you if you kind of take away if you lose sight of the the social roots and causes the political causes, all you get is just interpersonal abuse, and and, and then so anyone can be racist. They're blacks, whites, people tweeting chalk eyes, and so on. We're we're all racist, um, and in a sense, that's what's happened to racism. It's become something that is a is a is a is a problem to be controlled or managed or dealt with by therapy rather than the political project. Uh, so. Yeah, just, just four quick points. I mean, I think the thing about the, the working class on football, I mean, I'm betraying my, um, my experience at the Arsenal. You know, you, the working class can't afford to get in. You know, it's, it's, it's changed and it's different. You know, um, lower leagues, other places, you know, the, the, class, the class profile of football, I think, has changed fundamentally. Second point, the thing about racism change, I think, is really important because it's a kind of moving target. Yeah. So uh, racism it doesn't mean the same thing in different periods and different places. And I think it's interesting the way how you know, anti-racist politics often has to play kind of catch up. You know. So the whole thing about kind of like you know after Rushdie, all of a sudden uh, we're not we're not black anymore. We're Asians. We're not even Asian anymore. We're Muslims. And you know the, the, the debates change. And there's there's often a kind of time lag in terms of people kind of. Uh, catching up, and it's the same with the whole kind of new racism, the Ray Honeyford kind of issue. So I think the thing about you know the EDL are not the the National Front, they're not the BNP. Their appeal is slightly different. So I think it's horses for courses in terms of how you combat that. Uh, third point, uh, I think it's important. As is it Kevin? Yeah. The, the made the point about the kind of like um, uh, the benefits of a bit of analysis. The need to differentiate between kind of ideas and practices and effect. Just just. Returning to the point I made at the beginning, that thing about the difference between this idea of racism, you know, this kind of post white idea that racism is just about prejudice, individual prejudice, and, and what individuals do, and you can manage it or therapy for it. And this other version of, of idea about racism, which is it's structural and it's long term and it's about the effects. That also has baggage though, because it, it's a real bugbear in social science. It causes, and causes very difficult to attribute, and the models of institutional racism were very kind of simplistic as well. Because any time you had a differential outcome, it was proof that there was institutional racism causing it, and that's a really weak argument. So there were problems with that. Fourth point: the thing about, I suppose, I suppose why we're talking about it at all is this: the spectacular nature of this popular sport, mega events. The symbolic politics, there's an, but there's an amplification, there's a bias, it, it amplifies this interpersonal stuff. Uh, and I suppose the thing about football, it's very much, it's interesting because it's very much about the politics of belonging as well. So it plays to that, but at the, the detriment and loss of the bigger structural, less personal, less sexy kind of familiar litany of you know, structural racial disadvantage and the rest of it. Okay, probably still not time. I'm going to take a couple of people who haven't spoken and had their hands up for ages. Uh, not everybody will get taken, and then the speakers will come in for one final minute. Uh, we have to finish on time. Uh, and there's a lady to your left, like, person, yeah, no, in front of you. Yeah, that's it. Um, my only meeting about five football matches in my life, um, and I think I've been to more than five football matches in my life. Uh, to subject it to the codes of the workplace is completely absurd, and uh, to be honest, I don't want my workplace to be subject to those codes either. And I, I, you know, what's what's happened is the very fact that we're taking seriously that they're main boring, that's what children do. I mean, why would a panel of grown men be talking about main calling as if it's something that anybody should do anything about? 
for grown-ups uh, when they're doing something on Saturday afternoon or Tuesday night when they have it. The, this is absurd. What, what's happened is that the word completely floated free of any idea. So how can you do anything other than just use those words as a net in which to catch people? And that net is set up by certain players and entrepreneurs, uh, moral entrepreneurs, and uh, is designed in a way to catch particular people. And obviously it could be anybody at football match who shouts those things, not going to ask for your class credentials. But the fact that anybody gets caught up in the passion of the game and says the wrong thing can get caught in that net. And uh, nobody bothers to ask John Terry what he actually thinks of black people or Rio Ferdinand. Do you really think that black people are biologically inferior? Nobody bothers to ask him that. They don't care because they're clearly completely relevant and obviously hardly anybody thinks that anymore. Um, so th th there's this very, very frightening disconnect between words and ideas. And uh, I don't even, I'm not convinced of the ideas that delete you're still kind of holding to. So this, this thing called racism that still persists. Elsewhere, that's failing to be tackled by our obsession with words. I don't think that racism exists either. That doesn't explain to me why Camberwell is very different to Leafy Dulwich, why Crystal Palace is very different. You know, none of those things explain anything. As you're saying, that there are, there's a complete lack of any explanation to why there might be some persistent differences in society. Um, okay. And this doesn't help us in any way. Okay, there's one person right at the very back had their hand up, no, uh, uh, right, uh, right in the corner, and then that, I'm afraid that's going to be it, and then we're back to the panel, yeah. Um, I'm from Luton actually, and um, a lot of people have been saying Nakeland doesn't really matter. Um, but there's an incident in Luton Town, um, Luton Town Football Club is in the centre of a very Asian area. Um, so Scott Robertson and members of the EPL decided to name call towards a, a certain group of Welsh people. Um, this descended into a mini riot with bricks and bottles thrown. Um, then they turned into the streets of an Asian area. Now, how do you think an Asian area is going to react to EPL members sh shouting abuse at them? So I don't think we should trivialise the power of words, especially in a heated environment. Um, and I think there should be no tolerance policy towards any kind of racism in any sport, not just football. In golf, for example, the Oak Tiger Woods is one of the few black men who are dominant in golf. If someone were to turn around and use a racist word against him, that should not be tolerated. Um, I think if a player, a mainstream player, starts using racist words, it in some way, in our public figures, whether we like it or not, it in some way legitimises those views, regardless of the fact, you know, it kind of goes back to the argument, oh, I might use your racist word, but I have black friends. That doesn't matter, you use that word, you have a responsibility, and it does legitimise those views, particularly if EDL is present there. Okay, thank you. Okay, back to the panel, the same order. Uh, one minute, one minute each, I'll be quite strict on do it. Okay, um, someone asked about Sepp Blatter and the handshake thing. I mean, I think Sepp Blatter expressed it quite clumsily, but um, essentially, um, I think he was right, which is that what is said on the football pitch should be settled on the football pitch or dealt with. Not necessarily with a handshake, but I think it's accepting that what, what goes on in the heat of battle is people will say things they don't necessarily mean. Yeah. When if I want to one well, I play I play a lot of seven and five side football, if I want to get someone sent off, I'll call them a <coughs> cock sucking rent boy. They'll usually take a swing at me and get sent off it. That's the way it works. And at the end of the game, I'll go to our big, you know, no You are a palace. <laughs> End of the game, you shake hands, and that's what, what people do. Now, if, if someone is being racist, I think you can still deal with it in that kind of way. You can, you can, you can deck them, or you can do whatever. But I mean, I think that's where it should be settled. And I think that once you start, there's a really dangerous precedent once you start to say that. I mean, that's essentially a private sphere where people are in, 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 a, in a sporting context. Once you say that that becomes open to regulation, all kinds of offensive language is used in, 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 a, in, a, in a sporting arena. If you want to criminalise that, you're going to end up damaging sport. And I, I think that would be a really perverse consequence. Thank you. Uh, Sunday. Um, I think racism still exists in our society. And if you don't believe that, you know, get some CVs, just change the names, apply for jobs and see what happens. Um, uh, football's probably made more progress on it than many other kind of spaces. So it's slightly <coughs> odd that it's, our, that it's so strongly our focus of anti-racist efforts. I think the danger, the, the question for us sort of civically as people interested in football is where's the balance between overblowing trivial incidents? You know, Alan Hansen was trying to say something kind of nice about black players and use the word coloured, uh, you know, when he was trying to be, you know, people going bonkers about that on Twitter, you're overblowing the trivial or ignoring serious incidents. And actually the captain of England and the captain of Chelsea calling somebody a fucking black cunt, you know, on television, actually it's a little bit serious. So, you know, poor John Terry, 
gets Joe to have the miss, you know, parks in one disabled parking space once and people start to think he's not a nice guy. But actually, you had to take that seriously up to a point. We took it, it was a shambles, actually. I wouldn't have settled it with a handshake. You set all the handshake things, you can settle the handshake. I wouldn't have took it into the courts either. It was obviously going to end up there. It was the sort of shambles that shows how seriously we take it. We lost an England manager, we lost an England captain. By taking it very seriously, what interests me most about this is you read the red tops, especially the Daily Star, not just the Sun paper that flirted with the EDL, is actually going bonkers to be on the anti-racist side of the argument. And actually, I think that matters in quite an important way. Okay. Uh, yeah, shortly then. Uh, yeah, football is in one sense a private sphere, but in one sense not. When uh, Barcelona is playing Real Madrid, one billion of people actually looking at the game. So it, it, it makes different what happens there and how you deal with what happens there. Uh, I think, um, I mean, we kind of draw out two, two forms of, of anti-racism, the kind of individual prejudice that has to be as a psychological thing and the structural. I think those two things uh, are connected to each other. You can't do one, uh, one thing. And, and I think that football is a great arena for anti-racist work. Football is, uh, gives a platform for discussing identity, gives a platform for discussing belonging, gives a platform for discussing how you deal with conflicts, should we shake hands or not. Uh, and I think that the anti-racist work inside football can be, should be much, much more than just wearing the right t-shirts. I think that you could do a lot, lot more work with young kids inside football uh, and, and kind of connected to questions about belonging, identity and your role in, in a team and your role towards each other. And that's how you should use football in an anti-racist work for my country. Thank you. Sit. I don't know how I'm going to play it out for a minute. I'm going to think. Um, I think, as I said at the beginning, I think my anxiety around this is uh, the problem of the kind of colorblind racism argument, but in a sense, the attempt to kind of do institutional hygiene and overly regulate perhaps or just police or nanny um, that kind of you know the etiquette the the speech acts and all that kind of stuff um, runs the danger of trivializing race and racism um, and it also runs the risk of distracting from real existent uh, profound important <coughs> kind of structural inequalities okay can we thank the panel and the audience for allowing <laughs>